We will be finishing chapter 1 uh, of the book of James today. Uh, so here we go. If anyone among you thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Let us pray. Father, we thank you uh, once again for the opportunity to come to your house, Father, to hear your word. I ask, Father, that you would, you would take this word. Lord, let us receive your word. Let it change our lives. Father, let us go out and glorify you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, last week I made a statement that the Word of God is incredibly uh, encouraging, right? It's incredibly encouraging, and, it, and, and it, it, it helps us. But oftentimes, at times, it can also be very convicting, right? So today's message, I think, is going to speak to every one of us. Uh, although a message can be convicting, our goal is to move toward perfection, not shy away from it, right? And, and by doing that, we can learn what pleases the Lord, what displeases Him. So here, James touches on a topic that every one of us has uh, struggled with, or still struggles with. So I encourage you to listen to this message with an open heart, and I'm certain uh, that we will grow uh, through God's Word, and we'll learn. So he says here, if anyone among you thinks that he's religious and does not bridle his tongue... Not only are you deceiving your own heart, but he says that person's religion is useless. That word uh, religion in the Greek it refers to an outward expression of an inward belief. So when we think about the word religious, it seems to have a negative connotation, right? And it's come to have this negative connotation because there are people who call themselves Christians that do not behave as Christians should behave. So I want to start off by saying this. Well-intentioned believers are not perfect. Right? Well-intentioned believers are not perfect. I'm not perfect. And just because we may not always live up to the ideals of Christianity, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are hypocrites, nor does it mean... Uh, it, it just simply means that we are not perfect. Right? Uh, a hypocrite is an actor. That's what a hypocrite is. It is the opposite of religious. This is someone who is acting in such a way that they want to conceal who they are on the inside. A hypocrite is someone who believes that there is something wrong only for other people and not for themselves, right? It's someone <laughs> whose actions do not line up with their beliefs. So he says if there's any among you who thinks he's religious. This is a person who is outwardly displaying an inwardly belief and does not bridle his tongue. Now what does it mean to bridle your tongue? To bridle your tongue simply means to restrain, to check, or to control your tongue by choosing what you will and what you will not say. So what's a bridle? A bri according to the Mer Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it defines a bridle as a headgear with which a horse is governed and that which carries a bit and reins. So when you have a bridle on a horse, you control the direction that that horse goes, right? Despite the fact that that horse is a whole lot stronger than you and it doesn't take that much strength to turn a horse. So here he's saying that if you, you don't bridle your tongue, your religion... Is, is, is fruitless, your religion is empty. And why does he say that? Because our outward actions are not lining up with what we say we believe. This is, important. This is an important topic to James because I don't, I don't know if you know this, but James talks about the tongue and speech in every single chapter of the book of James. Every single chapter, he talks about it. So this is obviously something incredibly important, right? It's so important that he, 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 he mentions it that many times. And if he mentions it that many times, let us take a look at what he says and what he's talking about. So the first thing that we need to know about is that our words we will be judged, right? 
In James 2.12, look what he says. He says, So speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. You know, right before this verse, James is talking about not showing partiality. More specifically, showing preferential treatment to people who have money compared to those who do not have money. And he asks the question, have you become judges with evil thoughts? Right? He goes on to say how to fulfill the royal law of love, right, is right here in James 2, 8 through 9. He says, if you, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. We fulfill the royal law by loving our neighbor. And that means that we don't judge someone based on their outward appearance, right? That we treat everyone the same. And that's what he's saying, that, that treating one group of people differently because of their outward appearance not only makes you a hypocrite, but you commit sin and a transgressor of the law is what he says. He goes on to say that if you keep the entire law, and stumble just in one thing, in one point, he says you're a transgressor of the law. He gives examples, and then he says this in the 12th verse. He says, so speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Notice that he elevates speech with action. Did you see that? He elevates speech with actions. A person who doesn't steal or commit adultery or murders anybody, but tells a lie that person still is a transgressor of the law. And we need to realize how important speech is because we tend to think that our words or our speech isn't as important as our actions. And he said that showing partiality was a sin. And how did they show partiality? With their words, right? Because he says, hey, you, you who are wealthy, basically here, you sit in this good seat. The poor people, y'all go on over there. Y'all sit, sit here at my footstool. You know, he gives examples. And um, the fact is, is in this example that, that we're given, partiality is the fruit, words are the branches, and evil thoughts ultimately are the root. James charges us to speak and to do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Our actions will be judged. Our words will be judged. And it perfectly lines up with what his half-brother, Jesus, spoke. In, J in Matthew 12, 36-37, look what he says. And these are the words of Jesus. He says, But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. He says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus explains right before this that what is inside ultimately is what's going to come out, right? A good tree is going to produce good fruit. A bad tree is going to produce bad fruit. Your words ultimately reveal your heart. Like I've said before, the hardest thing for us to see is to see ourselves, right? And Jesus said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As believers, we are to strive toward perfection. And you know, because you, you want to know what's ultimately in your heart, listen to what's coming out of your mouth, right? I've learned a lot about what people say by listening to what... The, what I, I learned a lot about people by what they say. Because what they talk about most often is what's in their heart. You know, I, and, and I don't like to use examples of myself, but... On Father's Day, uh, I received a text from a person, and the text started off by saying, Happy Father's Day to a person who could use some lessons on how to be a father. And this person went on to just annihilate me in this text over an issue that is, none of, one, none of her concern. Two, uh, she... she, she she, she attacked me as a father. She attacked me as a husband. She attacked me as a, a Christian. 
and then said that my wife, who had previously died uh, a couple, about less than two years ago, who passed away, said that she would be not only rolling over in her grave, but she would be damning me to hell. <laughs> this is pretty mean stuff. And I prayed about it, I thought about it, because I, your, your, your initial inclination is to defend self. Obviously, this person doesn't know what she's talking about. So I, I thought about defending myself, but as I looked at the, the words that were in that, I realized that this person has a great deal of disdain for me. You know, and, 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 and sometimes it's just better not even to answer. You know, I didn't want, I didn't deserve, the, this person didn't deserve uh, a, a reply. But two, we have to realize that I could have reacted out of anger and, and, and said some really mean things back. The fact that I didn't, that's what Jesus is, or that's what James here is talking about. He's talking about that we have to put, doesn't mean that we're perfect, but what he's saying is that you've got to have a, if you don't bridle your tongue, that you, you can't just say whatever you want to say and, and then blame it on something else. Well, they said something mean to me, so I gave it right back to them. We are to be different than those in the world. Amen? Amen. We are called to be different. So, uh, you know, the second thing that he talks about, the tongue, although it is a small member, it perhaps is one of the most impactful parts of our entire body. Most of chapter 3 talks about the tongue. There's so much in there that could be said, but i gotta, gotta got to focus it down to stay with the topic at hand. Look at verse 2 of chapter 3. Look what he says here. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Now here's a whole lot of truth here. That we all, look, all of us, stumble in many things. There is no one who is perfect except for Christ. He speaks the truth about all humanity here. That, all, that, that we all, all of us that are human are prone to stumbling. Not just in one or two areas, but know what? We're, or, or even in a few, but look what he says, that we all stumble in many things. If we're not careful, we're going to miss a great deal of wisdom here that, 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 that he says here. Look what he says. How, how about this? How many people here want to be perfect? To never stumble again. How many? I mean, are we striving there? Look what he says. If, that's a contingency, anyone, that includes you, right, me, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. What is the lesson to be learned here? Are you struggling? Are you stumbling in many things? Do you know where you ought to start? Start right here. Start right there. Start with the mouth first, because if you can control the mouth, you can control the rest. Amen? James goes on to compare the tongue to, much like in chapter 1, uh, uh, like bits in a horse's mouth. He also compares it to a, a rudder on a ship. Think about how huge ships can be, right? And going in the waves, how strong waves are, right? Right? And when going up against this, but yet this little rudder can 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 change uh, can really control where the ship goes. Our mouths can change uh, the course of our life. You know, you you may say, "Well, this is America. We got freedom of speech." Yes, that is true. But just because you have the freedom of speech doesn't mean you should say anything that comes to your mind. Amen. James tells us that the tongue here in uh, the fifth verse, he says, even the tongue is a little member that boasts great things. See how great a forest a little kin uh, fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set 
uh, on fire by hell. A tongue that is, that is unrestrained can defile the entire body. He talks about a little fire can destroy a great forest, right? He goes on to talk about how uh, man has been able to tame all sorts of animals, even. But, but he says that he can tame all of that, but yet he can't tame the very thing that is in his mouth. Right? In verse 9 through 12, James points out the dichotomy that's in our mouth. He says, with it we bless God and uh, God, our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not be so. You have absolutely no idea of the blessing that we have to speak. You know, and, and, and again, I'm going to bring up uh, my wife that had passed. She had ALS. And for those who don't know what ALS is, it's a neurological disease. 100% of the people who get it, they all die. It, it, it begins to affect where the muscles in the body, right? Her biggest concern when she was diagnosed with ALS, her biggest concern is that I don't want to lose my legs. She didn't want to lose the independence of being able to just get up and... So that was a big concern of hers. Her biggest concern. But after going through that whole walk with her, the hardest thing was her not being able to... Because the, the tongue is a muscle. Without the tongue, guess what? You're not eating. You're not swallowing. You're not chewing your food. Without the tongue, you can't speak. And I, I have to say that the, 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 the most horrific part of all of that was losing communication. And, and, and so when I, when I read this about the tongue, and it talks about it in a negative way, but we have to realize the blessing that we have because until you lose something, you don't really know. You know, what is that, that the old uh, rock and roll song, you don't know what you got till it's gone? Well, the fact is, is that we have such a blessing right here that we can impart wisdom to the next generation. We can do a lot of good with it. But the problem is, is that oftentimes we do a lot of bad with it as well. And so this, is, this gift, we ought to use this gift in a manner that is worthy. Amen? You know, there are a lot of gifts given by God, and, and like I said, they ought to be used for good, kind of like the Internet, right? The Internet has a lot of great stuff. Can you imagine? I mean, we could not imagine in the 90s being able to get on our phone and contact people around the world and to be able to just pull up information like boom, boom, boom. Man, there's a lot of good to the internet. But there's also a lot of bad, right? There's much evil. You got pornography. You got manipulation. There's mean people. You got social media where people will just destroy you. You know, and say mean things. But the fact of the matter is, is that there, something that it can be used for good oftentimes is used for bad. And we want to make sure. Because like he says... Blessings and cursing shouldn't come from the same mouth. The third thing that he talks about uh, here in the fourth chapter is speaking evil and judging. James 4.11, he says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you are a judge of the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. So look what he says here, that we are not to speak evil, and that could be translated not to slander one another. We're not to speak anything that would hurt them or to injure them. And it's pretty straightforward, isn't it, right? That we're just simply not supposed to do that. We're not to judge them either. If you look at, in, in, in that chapter 4, if you look from verse 1 to verse 10, you see what the focus is, right? Right? He starts off by talking about wars and all this infighting, and then he tells us where they all come from, a desire of pleasure. That we don't need to be friends with the world, and by doing so we make ourselves enemies of God. 
He goes on to say that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. He tells us that we need to submit to God and submit to His Word. He talks about cleansing ourselves from sin and humbling ourselves, and that the Lord will lift us up in verse 10. And then He gets to the point in verse 11. And the focus seems to change. In 1 through 10, the focus is on self. That we need to be looking at ourselves, right? But what happens in verse, verse 11? He starts saying, hey, don't be speaking evil of others. But, but it's like the focus instead of us looking, because our, our goal is to, to, like I say, worry about ourselves. Make sure that, that we are following God, that we are serving Him. But when our focus gets on to somebody else, we're going to worry about trying to clean somebody else up when we're not clean. Right? It changes the focus that he says that we are not to speak evil of one another. As Christians, we are brethren and we ought to be united. That should, should be the thing, the number one thing that should unite all of us. It's not our skin color, not our where, where we've been. Nothing should unite us more than Jesus Christ. That is the reason that we are here. Just like he was talking about the poor and the rich. We shouldn't be reunited to the, to the rich because we just want, want to be around their money. But the thing that ought to unite all of us is, is Christ and Him crucified. We are Christians. And ultimately what he's saying is that if you don't have anything nice to say about a brethren, don't say anything at all. You're better off being quiet. Because a brother should not take pleasure in making the faults because some people think, well, that's just talking nasty about them or, or God. But listen, if you gossip about somebody, you can hurt their reputation. If you slander them and all that. He goes on. So in doing, doing this, when we do this, we go against the royal law that James was talking about in chapter 2 where he says to love your neighbor as yourself. James is saying that by speaking evil of his brethren... Uh, and judging his brethren, that that person is speaking evil of the law and judging the law. And why is that, you ask? Why is it that we're, we're speaking evil of the law if we're speaking evil of, of the person? Because you know what? When you break the second commandment, what is, what is the great, the, 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 the two greatest commandments are what? Love God with everything, and the second is likened unto it. What did Jesus say? To love your neighbor as yourself, right? So, so if, if we're breaking that, if, then what happens is, is that we are a breaker of the law. And we're putting ourselves ultimately above the law. Look what he says. He says, but if you judge, but if you are a judge of the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. If you're a breaker of the law, how many know that you are in no position to judge anybody else? Right? How can I be in a position to judge others if, I, if my life is full of sin and I'm a breaker of the law, how do I have the right? I have no right to judge somebody else. Jesus was saying the same thing in Matthew. Look what he says. Judge not that you, will, uh, that you be not judged. He says, for, the, for with what you judge, what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck out of your eye and look, there is a plank in your own eye. The fact of the matter is, is Jesus is saying the same thing that James is. That Listen, if you're a breaker of the law, you have no business trying to correct somebody else. Trying to judge other people. Right? And, and, and here, James, he, he also... So, so here we, we have to be careful about slandering people. He tells us not to judge people. But then he also moves on to something else in that same chapter, chapter 4. He talks about boasting. Look what he says here. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will uh, go in such and such a city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and make profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, 
we shall live and do this or do that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So James, he begins stating an example that we commonly do. We talk about when you're making plans, right? We make plans and then we discuss them. And James makes a valid point here. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, right? And none of us, because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow, not one of us. And he reminds us of the brevity of life by saying it's like a vapor that appears for a little time. Right? And then vanishes away. He tells us how we ought to, what state, how we should rephrase that. He says, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or to do that. And by saying it that way shows a great deal of humility. One, we're affirming the fact that God has us in His hands. We're, we're, we're affirming that, right? My tomorrows belong to God. Not only that but, that, but that particular thing that one person is planning will only happen if God wills it, right? Again, it's signifying that our lives are for His glory. He says in verse 16 that, that, that boasting in arrogance is evil. And the root of this boasting is that some erroneously believe that they can control tomorrow that they can determine what will and won't happen in their life. And he's saying that this kind of boasting in arrogance is evil. We may not think about it. We're just like, hey, we're just making plans. But, you know, when we start making plans, we're not, we don't have God in mind when we're, we're thinking that, that way. He goes on, he talks about also in the mouth in, in, in chapter 5. Chapter 5, 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The word here could be translated to complain uh, against another. So no good, nothing good can ever come out of complaining. Right? Nothing good can ever come out of complaining. It doesn't make the one complaining any better, right? It doesn't make you feel any better, nor does it help for, for those who sit around and listen to you complaining. Right? There's a warning here. He says, least you be condemned. The judge is standing at the door. And we would do well to remember that the Lord is near, right? If, 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 you know, if you're doing something and you're going, I don't know if this is, if I should be doing this. I don't really know if I should say this. Then ask yourself, if Jesus was sitting in that room, would you do it? Would you say it if Jesus was standing right there? Look what he says. The judge is standing at the door. And when you have the idea that, that, that he is near, right, it changes the way that you're going to behave. Right? It changes what you will say. When you, when you realize that we will be judged by every idle word, it, it makes us think that, hey, maybe I need to kind of put a bridle on this thing, right? Maybe I need to bridle this thing a little bit more. Listen, we, when we're experiencing trials and you're going through trials, listen, things can be stressful and it can be an incredibly difficult time. But, but we don't need, and what he's saying is that we don't need to turn against each other. Right? We don't need to turn it about each other. He talks about those, those that endure. Those are the people who will be blessed. Right? The last place that James talks about uh, the tongue is in James 5, 12, where he says, Above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. The fact of the matter is, is that we ought to be truthful in everything that we say. We should never have to get to a point where we go, I swear to God, I, 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 that such and such and such and such. I, you hear people all the time, I swear on my mother's grave. You know, listen, a, a desperate liar will still be a liar, right? 
I don't care whose grave they swear on. The fact of the matter is, is that if we always tell the truth, we won't need a special place to say, I swear. Because you know what? When, when we're swearing about things, it's like, okay, I'm really telling the truth now. I might not have been telling you the truth here. And what he's saying is that, listen, we should speak the truth all the time. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If we speak the truth all the time, we wouldn't need a special occasion to, to swear. He tells us in chapter 5, verse 13 through 18, James tells us that we should, what we should do instead of complaining. You know what we ought to be doing instead of complaining? Is that we are to fill our mouths with prayer. We are to sing songs, psalms, you know, confessing or our trespasses to one another. See, we ought to be using our mouths for good. And that's what he talks about there in chapter 5. So when it comes to our tongue, this is what James... And again, I know that it's very short about each topic. But that he tells us that our words will be judged. That our tongues, although they are small, they are the most impactful member of our body. He addresses speaking evil and judging. He talks about boasting. He talks about grumbling or complaining. And he also talks about swearing. So let's go back to the 26th verse in chapter 1. If any among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. James is saying that if you think that you're religious and you don't bridle your tongue, that you're, 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 t you're basically, what he's saying is that it's useless or it's empty or it's fruitless. You know, I was thinking about Jeremiah 13 this last week when I was thinking about this message. And, and God told Jeremiah to take this sash and he says, go hide it in a rock down near the Euphrates River. So he goes and he hides this sash, and then it said after many days, we don't know how long, but it had to be many days, God says, okay, you go back and you get that sash. So when Jeremiah goes back, he finds the sash, he pulls it out, guess what? It's good for nothing. And then God begins to tell him about the judgment on his people. But the fact of the matter is, there's a difference between the sash being no good, but, but the religion, the religious people who do not bridle their tongue, though their religion may be useless, their tongue can be so damaging. Religion seeing that, that the fact that, that we represent Christ by calling ourselves Christians, and that if we do damage with our tongues... Bride on our tongues doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that. Because he says, you know, we, we all stumble at it. But we need to be reminded from time to time. And to keep it in check. To keep it in check. Because like I said, we all stumble. And why is the tongue really the, the gauge of useless religion? Why is it that it's the tongue that's the gauge? Luke 6, 45, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Jesus draws this distinction between a good man and an evil man. The heart speaks from the treasure drawn from it. Right? Evil men, they draw from evil treasure. Good men, good treasure. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So what's ultimately in your heart is what comes out of your mouth. That's why... James is, is basically saying that, that your mouth is the gauge of whether or not your religion is good or useless. 
If anyone among you thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Having a bridle on a tongue is someone who recognizes and agrees with the Word of God. You may have a bad thought. You may want to say something back to somebody. You may want to put somebody in their place. But every time you stop yourself, you know what you're doing? You're agreeing with God's Word. You're agreeing with God's Word when you, ref when you control yourself. doesn't mean that you don't have it in you. doesn't mean that you couldn't say something. I I'm kind of quick-witted at times. I could say some things. But you know what? That isn't what God wants me to do. That isn't what His Word tells me to do. And every time we stop ourselves, we're agreeing with God's Word. And every time we open our mouths, we go against it. And so that's why we, we are the ones. Listen, you're the gatekeeper of this, your own mouth. You can't blame somebody. Well, you don't know what they did. You don't know what they did made me say that. You can't blame nobody else, right? The fact is, is that if you allow something out of your mouth that you shouldn't have, you repent. And when you repent, you're agreeing with God's Word again, right? And here he's saying that if you don't bridle your tongue, if you just, you're not even going to control it, you're going to say whatever comes to your mind, he's saying that your religion is useless. He's talking about the one who is unrestrained. Those that use their words to control or to harm other people without any conviction. And I also want to point out, this is the third time in the first chapter that, that, that James discusses deception. Isn't that something? He talks about deception in verse 16. He says, do not be deceived that every good and perfect gift is from God. Uh, so the fact is, is that God isn't the one that is tempting us. God uh, isn't the one who is, who is putting things on us. He goes on, he says that, you know, that, that every good and perfect gift comes from Him. In verse 22, he says that if we are, we are not doers, but hearers only, that we are deceiving ourselves. And here in verse 26, that we deceive our own hearts if we do not bridle our tongue. And like I said before, self-deception can be the most insidious deception. Hypocrites don't know they're hypocrites. Have you noticed that? Hypocrites don't know that they're hypocrites. I've never heard someone proudly boast, yes, I'm a hypocrite. Nobody does that. You know, and so, so the fact is, is that hypocrites don't know that they're hypocrites. And that's why we ought to take time for introspection. We ought to. What did he say? He said that if we would judge ourselves, we would not need to be judged. The last thing I want to know is when I get to the gates of heaven, when I stand before God Almighty, I don't want to find out I've been doing it all wrong. I don't want to find out that I have been deceiving myself. We want to run around and blame the devil for everything, but the fact is, is that he's talking about self-deception. That we will deceive ourselves. We want to make sure that we are not deceived by others. That's, that's for sure. But we also want to make sure that we're not deceiving ourselves. In the last verse of chapter 1, James contrasts vain, empty, useless religion. He contrasts that with pure and undefiled religion. Look what he says. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Pure and undefiled religion has two parts. Has two parts. One, he says to visit. That means really to look after or to take care of orphans and widows in their trouble. Essentially, we are to help those who are in need. Those who cannot help themselves. And we are to, the second thing is that we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We are not to be like the world. 2 Corinthians 6 
8, uh, 6, 8, 17 through 18 says, Therefore come out among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. To be a follower of Christ, we have to come away from the world. We have to come out from amongst them. We have to separate ourselves from those in the world. And I always say that look around, right? Look around. You look around at the people that we spend most of our time with, right? And if you look around and you see a bunch of fools, know that you're probably not at much different. Those who are wise will walk with the wise. And, and, and he tells us that we have got to turn away from sin. That's a part of, of, of the undefiled religion. That we must repent. And we don't even hear that in the church often anymore, do we? We don't hear about repentance. Oh, here, just say this sinner's prayer. No repentance, no sanctification. I'm reminded of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's words. And it's a, it's a, little, it's a rather long quote, but I, I want to say it because it has great truth. Listen to this for a moment. And he's talking about the difference between cheap grace and, expense, and, and, and costly grace. He says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living incarnate. He says costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field for the sake of which a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ who, for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciples will leave their nets and follow him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. A gift that must be asked for. A door at which man must knock. He goes on to say that such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. It is grace because he calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. It is grace because it justifies the sinners. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what that what costs God much should never be cheap to us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. He says, come out from amongst them. Come out from amongst them. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James is saying that we are to be doers of the word. Amen. And, 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 and like I said, it's, it's twofold. It's helping those who can't help themselves and is turning away from the things of the world. It requires both of those things for us. we got to make a decision. You know, not a half-hearted decision. Are we serving Christ or not? Are we Christians? It's not one or the other. It's both. It's loving our neighbor as ourself and it's turning away from the things of this world. There is a contrast between costly and cheap grace. Amen. So next week we're going to start our study into the second chapter of James, uh, which will be, like I say, chapter 2. Uh, but um, I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've been learning a lot by studying His Word. 
uh, in, in James, and there's a lot in James 1, and we will get into James 2, like I said, next week. Let us pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. I pray, Father, that you would draw us close to you, Father, that we would walk in that pure and undefiled religion, that we would love our neighbors as ourselves, and, Father, that we would just cleanse things out of our lives and that we would um, re repent and turn from the things of this world. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you that it sets us on the right course. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Be with us. Amen.